Welcome to Faith and Freedom Fighters. I'm Robert Muse, co-founder and senior counsel of the American Freedom Law Center. And as usual, I'm joined by my fellow freedom fighter, co-founder and senior counsel, David Yurashami. David will uh, be appearing today uh, just via audio as we're having some technical difficulties. So those of you who are listening to the podcast, it won't make much of a difference. Those who are gonna watch the uh, video cast, um, you won't see David's smiling face, but you'll certainly hear his voice. And I want to begin this podcast with wishing everyone a happy and joyous 4th of July, which will be upcoming this weekend, uh, the birthday of freedom, our Independence Day from tyranny. On July 4th, 1776, the greatest nation in the history of mankind was born, a nation that understood that God was the source of true freedom and that there were certain inalienable rights that no man or government could either grant or deny, the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You know, the brave men who signed our Declaration of Independence knew full well that liberty comes at a price. In fact, when they signed the Declaration, they understood that they were signing their death warrant because it was an act of treason to the king. Today, we are again faced with a serious challenge to our freedom, a challenge from secular progressives on the left who reject the belief that America is a great nation and the truth that authentic rights come from God. In short, they do not trust in God as our national model dictates. Instead, they seek to remove any reference to God from government and the public square. They want to create new rights ordained by man, rights that are contrary to God's law. And in the process, they want to suppress our right to speak and act in accord with our deeply held religious beliefs and convictions. So similar to when those patriots who signed our Declaration of Independence in 1776, today we live in a pivotal time. Consequently, we must ask, are we willing, as our founders were, to fight for our God-given rights, or are we going to let secular tyranny reign over our lives? As Thomas Paine observed, quote, These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will, in this crisis, shrink from the service of their country, end quote. Thus, the choice is clear. Will you be a summer soldier and a sunshine patriot? Or will you join us in this critical fight to protect and preserve our freedoms from the tyranny of the left? You know, I can assure you, and David can assure you, that the American Freedom Law Center is committed to fighting for our faith and freedom, just as those early patriots were willing to fight for this great nation. Our answer to the challenges we face today is, as Patrick Henry stated, quote, I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death, end quote. Please don't take this day, the 4th of July, for granted. Don't take for granted what it represents. You know, our founding fathers did a lot for us, and we got to be thankful for them, and we should celebrate the 4th of July as the birthday of our freedom. So, David, with that, I want to welcome you, and I'm sure you may have a few remarks uh, about that. Thank you, Rob. And really well said, the, the, the liberty interest that is at the heart of the 4th of July, our day of independence as the great nation that we are, is fundamental to human existence. Without liberty, without the ability to, to choose for oneself within the realm of what we call ordered liberty, the individual soul is rendered a nullity and human existence that part of the humanity of existence is denuded we now live in a time as you pointed out and we've said on this podcast over and over again of a non-kinetic civil war the progressives the hard left together with the soft left, control all of the levers of power. They have the political domain wrapped up. They have education, not just at the university level, but into the high school, junior high, elementary school levels. Uh, just as a note, um, a student recently um, was denied a petition for writ of certiorari to the Supreme Court when um, the school board held that 
um, he should have the right um, to go to any bathroom he wished. And this, I, I mentioned the student, but the school board had petitioned, had appealed that decision and ultimately petitioned the Supreme Court on the basis that the, the court ruling that held that the school board had to allow males into girls' bathrooms uh, and girls into and men and boys' bathrooms by just how they wanted to identify um, was impermissible. Um, and um, the Supreme Court did not grant the certiorari, which is not unusual, but it means that um, what we're seeing across the board, this idea that that biology doesn't matter, that wokeness matters more than anything else, um, that the government is going to dictate to us and to school boards and to businesses how not only how they must behave, but how they must think about these issues. So for example, a businessman who has a artistic cake bakery. Um, he's required as a Christian to um, provide his goods and services to a LGBTQ, whatever the alphabet is, wedding or celebration, um, even though it goes against his religious principles, notwithstanding the fact that the the customer can go to any of a million bakeries out there, but this baker is going to be required to embrace their preferences, their behavior um, against his religious principles. These are the things that we're up against. And um, it is my absolute view that um, there's, there's no rolling this back simply through politics and civility that it's going to require more than that. Now, God forbid it should ever require violence or the breaking of any law, but the reality is, is that um, we're in a place now where if good patriotic Americans are not prepared to stand up and fight non-kinetically and legally at, at the highest involvement in, for our liberty interest, um, what little liberty we have is going to dissipate entirely. You know, when you, you mentioned about the, um, you know, that the case with the, the student using the bathroom that the student uh, wanted to use based on the gender that they identify with, as opposed to the gender that matches their, how they were born biologically. Again, the, the left just absolutely disregarding biology as a, as a science. You mentioned they failed to grant certiorari just for our listeners, and probably most of you know this, but that just means they, they did not grant review of the case. Uh, to get review, you have to file what's called a writ of certiorari. It's basically uh, the court can, uh, can grant cases. They have discretion to grant review. They didn't grant review, so what that meant is the lower court, the appellate court's ruling in favor of the student choosing which bathroom they want to use over what the school board desired. Um, that that remained in effect and is then uh, is thus the law. You know, we we hear things all the time about you know equality and and, and in fact there's the uh, you know the Equality Act that the that they're trying to pass through the um, you know as federal legislation. It's it's not about equality. It's always about bending your will, right? Like you mentioned the the masterpiece uh, cake uh, you know case where you know they could have gone to any number of bakers, but they knew that this baker was a Christian. And they knew that there was going to be an objection to, to his, him objecting to baking a cake for a so-called same-sex, uh, you know, uh, wedding. And, uh, and so they, you know, they force these issues. They want to bend your will. It's not about equality. They don't care about your Judeo-Christian religious beliefs. Remember, we, we talked about this in a prior podcast. This is all about attack on Western civilization, attack on Judeo-Christian values. And, uh, and those, are the, those are the foundations of our freedoms. And that's why, again, the 4th of July is so, uh, so important. And this is a good segue to discuss what I want to discuss next is a couple of news articles about, uh, I would say, somewhat related stories. When you consider that America is the beacon of freedom and really hope for the world, right, because you got millions of people who are trying to come here, 
trying to get, you know, trying to have a taste of freedom that, that uh, we've been blessed with having. Um, the opposite is true of communist China, which to me ep epitomizes the darkness of oppression and tyranny. It's really, it's a godless country. It has uh, no respect for life and no respect for liberty. If America has its opposite in this world, it would be China. But uh, it's no big surprise that both CNN and ABC News recently ran glowing stories praising China and its dictator, uh, Xi Jinping, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, I believe I am. You know, one of the articles, and these are two articles that were posted on, on Fox News. One of them is titled, CNN Roasted for Glowing Coverage of Chinese Communist Party's Anniversary. And, and, it's, and it also is the tagline is, this is GNN as opposed to CNN. So in this story, it says, CNN is once again being dubbed China News Network after publishing a glowing report on the upcoming 100-year anniversary of China's Communist Party. The Chinese Communist Party is about to turn 100, but Xi will be the real star, CNN International tweeted to accompany a link to a story about an upcoming celebration that will feature fireworks and a speech by China's leader, Xi Jinping. It said, and it goes on the story, goes on to say, earlier this month, CNN was mocked for publishing a report that boasted of China's coronavirus vaccination rates. According to data provided by China, the liberal network raised eyebrows with the headline, quote, China's about to administer its billionth coronavirus shot. Yes, you read that right, end quote. Both reports were tied to a newsletter rolled out by CNN this month called Meanwhile in China, which is essentially... <laughs> They're just regurgitating the propaganda that's being issued by the Chinese government. None of this, this information that goes out in the quote-unquote Chinese press is, uh, I mean, they don't have a liberal press. Everything is vetted by the government, and it has a purpose. It's, it's for propaganda purposes, and there's CNN being the echo chamber for uh, China's propaganda. And then the other news story, it's titled, ABC News Bashed for Publishing Glowing Profile by AP of Chinese Communist Party. ABC News was the focus of major criticism this week following its promotion of what critics called a glowing profile of the Chinese Communist Party's planned 100th anniversary celebration. The piece by the Associated Press credited the communist regime's policies for the country's rise to becoming an economic powerhouse, but it failed to mention the gross human rights abuses perpetrated by the CCP. It's it's remarkable, and these these are recent stories, right? Right here, we we're going to be uh, you know approaching the Fourth of July, as we discuss in the opening of this uh, you know of this episode, right? The the birthplace of freedom, and here you have ABC and CNN writing glowing reports about the commu about communist China's communist China Party's 100th anniversary. There is no more oppressive, tyrannical regime in existence today than China. And yet they kowtow to, this, uh, to these oppressors. These oppressors who, by the way, uh, more likely than not, were the ones who uh, you know, let loose this COVID-19 virus on the world, killing you know, countless millions of people, devastating economies, and, and wreaking havoc more so than really any nuclear weapon would have. Yet these are the, these are the, this is the country that uh, CNN and ABC you know, hold up. Meanwhile, right, they criticize America. Oh, we're a bunch of racists. We're, you know, slave country, despite the fact that we're the ones that freed people, continue to free people. There's more freedom here in the United States, more freedom and opportunity for minorities than anywhere else in the world. In China, minorities are being killed off. It's called genocide. They're in the middle of doing it right now. Yet this is the country that gets glowing praise by the uh, CNN and ABC. And oh, by the way, glowing praise by all these, you know, NBA and other athletes who have all these shoe deals with, uh, you know, with uh, uh, companies that use the, the labor in, uh, in China in glowing, you know, praise of China. Meanwhile, they're taking a knee when the, uh, when the national anthem is uh, being played here in our own country. It's absolutely disgusting. David, comments. You know, as just as to the athletes, it's even worse than that, of course, because the, for example, um, you know, you have LeBron, LeBron James, now the key spokesman in the NBA as the senior uh, member of the NBA in the present um, version of uh, the GOAT, right? The greatest of all time. And um, he's constantly attacking the U.S. as racist, et cetera. And yet um, when it comes to um, 
the NBA and its outreach to China to have exhibition games and TV rights, not a single word of protest, nothing. But that it just scratches the surface. I mean, let's face it. Um, there's no way to, other than to put it, the Communist Chinese Party that runs China is a murderous tyranny with absolutely no limits or bounds for their murderous, tyrannical behavior. There's none. Think about the United States. People complain about um, our country, our government. There's lots to complain about. Um, and there's a constructive way and a non-constructive way, but you're free to be non-constructive if you want. But the reality is, at least we have today the semblance of elections. I would argue that our election system is also now rigged in favor of Democrats and, and leftists and progressives. But at least we have that semblance. At least we have a semblance of a judicial system. They have none of that. Um, Everyone knows that their electoral system is a fraud. Everyone knows the judicial system in China is a fraud. It's all about what the Communist Chinese Party wants. And But think about this. You want to know the hypocrisy of the left? Facebook bans and continues to ban the former president of the United States on the basis that they don't like his speech. Um, they don't like his spin on the facts they don't even they don't like his opinion so they ban him well i just went to facebook.com forward slash communist party of china and guess what facebook allows the communist party of china a facebook website and the first link today is so happy for Korea's peace process, world peace. What peace process? What possible peace process is North Korea engaging in? And it's just one wink after the other of communist Chinese propaganda, unadulterated propaganda, false, and everything else you would want to say about it. How is that? How does that exist side by side with the censorship of the former president of the United States, of the censorship of so many conservative voices out there because they don't like what they're saying about the um, uh, COVID virus or about the vaccines or any number of other issues that they're sensitive on. Just absolutely absurd. Yeah, and you know, every bit of information that gets out of China because they, they're even better at censoring than Facebook and Twitter are right now. Every bit of information that comes out of China has been vetted and it's, and it's vetted by the government and it's propaganda, right? If something does slip out, you can rest assured that they, they'll crack it down pretty hard and uh, in, in ways that are, you know, violent and oppressive in, in, many, in many respects. You know, remember the uh, protests in Tiananmen Square, right? What was the, uh, what was the government's, uh, you know, response to that? you know, tanks and, and military coming out and, and beating it down in a very violent way. Yet uh, we seem to forget all those, uh, all those things. Meanwhile, you know, back at the ranch here in the United States where we have a First Amendment, you know, you got Facebook, Twitter, all these guys censoring people, censoring us. That's why we've, you know, sued Twitter uh, already and we'll be suing Facebook uh, relatively uh, soon here in the United States under the First Amendment. And, uh, and yet these guys are, you know, praising China and China's allowed to continue on uh, using uh, using social media, and as you know, you know President Donald Trump was uh, is is shut off from the social media. It's it's well, you know what's fascinating, bad. Rob, yeah. is that is that Facebook allows the Communist Party of China to have their own Facebook page while censoring President Trump and other conservatives. Yet China, as a country, blocks Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you, you can't make this stuff up. It's uh, it's quite Orwellian, um, to say the least. You know, and, and dealing with China, just to segue to the next thing, you know, uh, Tucker Carlson um, did an interview with a Chinese defector on the origins of the uh, of the uh, Wuhan virus, COVID-19, the, uh, 
you know, the, the Chinese flu, let's call it for what it is. If you want to call things the Chinese, the, you know, the, the Spanish flu and everything else, no reason why you shouldn't call this the Chinese flu. Um, but from the COVID-19, now uh, I know it was, uh, it was, it was a, 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 you had to purchase a subscription for it. Uh, I know you said you uh, reviewed some of it, and my wife has a subscription to it, and we watched some of it last night. But a very uh, a fascinating interview with this uh, with this Chinese uh, defector, and you know, quite frankly, somebody whose uh, life is probably at risk, even here in the United States, for her to come out and, and how she was speaking out. David, you have you want to cover some highlights of of the interview that you heard um, from this Chinese defector with Tucker Carlson? Yeah, her name is, and I don't know that I'm pronouncing it correctly, Doctor. Li L I Meng M E N G Yan Y A N, and she was a very high-level um, researcher at the um, W H O um, virology lab in um, Hong Kong, and the her position and that lab generally was to research outbreaks of viruses in that area, that one of many of their responsibilities. And when the um, COVID virus first um, became public, she was asked and actually um, tasked with studying um, what that was all about. But as she testifies um, to Tucker Carlson, uh, not literally testifying in a courtroom, but as she tells Tucker Carlson, she was told by her supervisor, and she names him, um, that she had to tread very carefully and not to touch the red line. Apparently, that's the term of art in China, which, of course, controls Hong Kong, where she works, that um, there are areas that make China look bad. You don't go there. Well, her research and she was the earliest one, and she had um, the closest um, perceived evidence. And she warned back in July of 2020 that from her research, the spread of the virus began at the Wuhan laboratory from her research, and she's a top notch virologist. This isn't some mid-level or low-level virologist. Um, and she reports that um, not only is all the evidence that it began at the laboratory, but that the markers of the thing, its characteristics, this virus, is such that um, it has all the telltale signs of a military weaponized research product. And I haven't seen her evidence of that, but that's her reporting. And of course, the evidence of it being military, and we've talked about the difference between so-called scientific evidence, measuring of facts, versus circumstantial evidence. Um, but when you look at this Wuhan lab, which is a um, one of the um, most uh, the highest level of security labs in the world to study these kinds of diseases, regularly carried out Chinese Communist Party military biological weapons research. And according to this Dr. Yan, the, the markers of this, of this virus indicate that it was indeed weaponized. Um, and then, of course, she points to the fact that things that we've pointed to, that early on, the Chinese government was in cover-up mode, early on. And what would, it have, what would it have taken to simply admit that there was a mistake at a civilian research lab in China? But they covered it up, suggesting something possibly more nefarious. It could very well be the Communist Party didn't want to be embarrassed. But... Um, the reality is, is that that cover-up started very early. It was extremely strong. They tried to shut her up. In fact, she's alleging now that her husband, who's a true blue party member, um, worked with the Communist Party to shut her up while she was in Hong Kong and has now been granted a visa with the help of the 
Chinese party to come to the United States, and she believes to threaten her and threaten her life. Now, that might sound, you know, wacky and, and, and conspiratorial, but this is the communist Chinese party. Now, we know that Putin kills people all the time that he doesn't like, dissidents and the like. He feeds them, uh, you know, radioactive uh, isotopes in their teas and their food. Do you think for a moment that the communist Chinese party would not be trying to shut this woman up? There's no doubt in my mind that they're certainly capable and they have the motivation to do so. Yeah, she, I, I recall from uh, listening to the to her, um, you know, her reporting as, as well that, uh, you know, she said that the military became interested when they started seeing the effects of coronavirus, they became, started to become interested and, you know, perhaps using a coronavirus as a biological weapon because it had a lot of uh, potential. And obviously we see it, it certainly does. And all the different components of how it's affecting people. And, you know, we've heard the term before, gain of function is all, in, from her, her perspective, uh, indicative of the fact that this thing was, was engineered in a way to be more lethal as a weapon. In fact, one of the things she she spoke about, which I found interesting as somebody who ended up getting coronavirus pretty badly, where it ended up hospitalizing me and I ended up uh, getting pneumonia from it, um, is that there's, uh, it's intended to have long-term effects too, and perhaps long-term uh, neurological effects, uh, headaches and, and other uh, impact. And it's interesting because, you know, we know just anecdotally from people who've had this virus, unlike other flus or other viruses, that they continue to feel fatigue. They continue to feel kind of symptoms even long after they've, uh, you know, supposedly recovered from it. So it's, the story's not over yet with, uh, with regard to this, uh, the coronavirus, its origins and, and the purpose for it. Uh, and, you know, and the other thing that was very interesting, and sadly, and you know, it just goes to show you, you know, comparing, you know, you want to do glowing praise of China, for goodness sakes, you know, they, they were praised about how they handled the virus in Wuhan. One of the things she said they were doing, they were like literally locking people into their homes, nailing the homes shut and securing them in a way. There were people that were dying of starvation in their homes who may potentially have been infected because they didn't want the infection to spread any further. So they literally did a lockdown in, uh, in a way that was uh, just extraordinary. And I, I recall her saying that there were even people that starved to death in their homes um, because of the, uh, they weren't allowed to even, even go out because they were locked in. You know, I like the juxtaposition, just like we juxtaposed um, the Facebook banning of President Trump and yet allowing the Communist Party to have their own Facebook while they ban Facebook in China. Um, well, here's another juxtaposition for you. Look at what Congress is doing today with all these January 6 inquiries, one committee after the other, trying to understand the causes and, and what have you of this and the, and the implications of the January 6 riots. Well, it's interesting to note that of the several hundred people being charged with crimes, only a small handful have been charged with anything other than essentially trespass. I mean, they throw in conspiracy, but I mean, very little violence. I went on the national public radio. This isn't the juxtaposition, but I'm just raising this as a um, parenthetical. I went on national public radio. I, that's my view of what the left thinks. Government-sponsored progressive leftist uh, media. And um, their headline was um, videos introduced in, in, at, in court um, in the various indictments and, and criminal processes um, show shocking amounts of violence. Viewer discretion advised, big bold letters. Well, I actually clicked on them. And what you see is a tiny handful of people getting violent, pushing and striking out at the police officers, a tiny handful, which is why there were no actual um, injuries on behalf of the, of the police, at least certainly nothing serious that I've heard of. Um, the fact is, is that the January 6th um, uh, trespass and, and violence, whatever else occurred um, is fairly well discrete, meaning it's, 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 a, it's a very insular event. When it comes to the COVID virus that has wiped out how many 
hundreds of thousands of people globally and in the United States and cost billions of dollars to the economy of this country and others. Congress is doing next to nothing to determine what caused this virus. Where did it begin and what caused it? And indeed, if you go to the media, other than Fox News and a few conservative outlets, you will find next to nothing on Dr. Yan and her reporting to Tucker Carlson as a frontline research investigator. You will find nothing about um, the detailed evidence establishing the, the source of the Wuhan virus at Wuhan laboratory and the military, the Chinese Communist Party's military fingerprints on this thing, nothing. You know, if, and if you don't know the cause, how are you supposed to stop this again in the, uh, you know, in the future? I mean, it just makes sense, right? You, you know, you, you learn all you can about its origins so you can prevent this from happening, happening again. Um, you know, just it's, it's, it's mind boggling when you think about it. And also, when you, you just another juxtaposition, how they treating January 6th compared to all these Black Lives Matter violent protests and Tifa protests all summer long. Where I don't know if you remember seeing that CNN, I think it was CNN coverage, where you have a reporter saying, "Oh, the protests have been largely peaceful," and in the background you got buildings and cars and flames in the middle of the night. Yeah, so much for for peaceful police uh, police stations being attacked, officers being attacked, people brutally courthouse. beaten in the streets. Had all uh, courthouses, just, right? It wasn't just burning buildings and private residences. They were attacking police stations and they were attacking federal courthouses. So yeah. you want to talk about an insurrection? They took over entire sections and called them, you know, La La Land or whatever the term was, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah, I forget the name. No go zones. I don't know what they no called. No go zones. Yeah, right. they had a term for it. Yeah, no, uh, unbelievable. Well, you know, um, I, we've we've been the last couple of podcasts been trying to do some uh, case updates, and uh, we were never able to get through them. Number one is uh, we've got a lot of cases going on, um, and uh, the other thing is new cases are always arising. But there's a few more that uh, we haven't gotten to, and and uh, probably for the next 15 minutes or so here before we wrap things up, um, I'd like to just kind of run through those. Um, unless you have any final comments about this, uh, about you know the Fourth of July and our liberty, and and you know juxtapose that against uh, China, which is apparently the favored country of the left. Uh, they apparently want to be like China and not be like the United States. Um, it's it's uh, it's disgusting. I mean, I don't know how else to uh, to describe it. This is a great country. And for all you patriotic Americans out there uh, listening, celebrate on July 4th this, the birth of this, this great, great nation um, and continue to place our trust in God. And, and we'll get through this uh, left-wing uh, communist assault on our, on our freedoms. So, um, so with that, I got a few cases I just want to review that we, we haven't uh, just kind of give updates on, cases that have been ongoing for many years. And anyone who's listening to this probably realizes that you know when you file a lawsuit things don't go that quickly i mean we we had a case that this was a record for us but it took um 10 years to finally get the favorable ruling we should have gotten um, from the u.s court of appeals from the sixth circuit and uh, many of these cases take three to five years before you can resolve them first one i want to mention was a case that we filed on our own behalf american freedom law center versus nestle nestle is the attorney general of uh, michigan and we also sued the Michigan Department of Civil Rights because they officially, as part of government records, government publications, they officially endorsed the Southern Poverty Law Center's so-called hate group list. And anybody who knows anything about the Southern Poverty Law Center, they are just a propaganda machine of the left. They are George Soros funded, very, very well funded. Um, their goal is to anybody whose uh, political views they disagree with, they, uh, they attack them as a hate group. Um, they try to marginalize them and to, you know, really to kind of remove their effectiveness by labeling them a hate group. Well, American Freedom Law Center has made that list. So they apparently dislike uh, what we do um, and, and probably by the fact that we, uh, we love this country. We love the 4th of July. We love our independence. And we love the fact this nation was founded on Judeo-Christian uh, principles. Those things apparently make us a hate group. Well, the Attorney General, Dana Nessel, she's a radical left-wing politician. She's weaponized her position as the Michigan Attorney, Generally, Attorney General and has, she's publicly vowed to, and these are her words, 
combat, fight, and tackle the so-called hate groups operating in Michigan with her uh, newly minted uh, hate crimes unit. That's what she calls it. She calls it a hate crimes unit. So we sued her, um, alleging, obviously, violations of our right of association, our right to freedom of speech. And uh, we have, uh, they tried to move to dismiss this case when we first filed it, and uh, the judge denied the motion to dismiss. And quite frankly, a very well-written opinion. And if he follows in line with the, uh, with the, with how he ruled on the motion to dismiss, um, I expect him to rule in our favor on our pending cross motions for summary judgment. So that's kind of hang firing. We're waiting. You know, a lot of things too. These, the lot right now because of COVID, a lot of the courts were shut down. They haven't had criminal trials. Their criminal dockets rearing back up. Um, so they're very much bogged down. So we we have this quite a few cases we have where we're waiting awaiting decisions from the courts, um, and it's taking a little bit longer than than usual because these aren't uh, usual times. Another case that we filed uh, that was jump, before you jump to another case. Yes. Just, I want our listeners to understand what the Southern Poverty Law Center is. The Southern Poverty Law Center was established in 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 the South. Um, and initially it went after the Ku Klux Klan and got some big judgments for um, their clients, African-Americans in the South that had been discriminated against and attacked by the KKK. Um, and the huge judgments that they got that won them so much notoriety and fame um, essentially was against a Ku Klux Klan that was bankrupt. I mean, th th there was no real defense. It was no big deal to get those kind of judgments. It was unique that they went after them and sued them and I tip my hat off to them for that. But ever since then, they have just turned in to a hardcore progressive money-making machine. Imagine a nonprofit organization, what we call a 501c3, a nonprofit corporation that has a half a billion dollars worth of assets of which they keep the lion's share offshore. Now, why did they do that? Well, I guarantee you the reason they do that is because their leadership were dipping into those funds by paying themselves through intermediaries all kinds of monies for contract services, uh, which you know were invisible to the rest of us. But it's just unheard of that a nonprofit organization through a direct mail campaign, which they established early on and was very successful, and through the big donations uh, from the George Soros's, et cetera, um, have a half a billion dollars of assets. And if you look at what they do with that money, it is literally next to nothing. They put out a bunch of internet reports on hate groups like ours, the American Freedom Law Center, without defining what that hate group actually has done to be so listed. But it's a fraud. It's a fraud from top to bottom. Yeah, well, and uh, one of the things that they listed as to why we were a hate group, it was actually one of their, their highlights, I forget which year it was, 2019 or something, um, was that we filed a, an amicus brief, a friend of the court brief in the U.S. Supreme Court uh, on behalf of several national security experts in favor of the so-called uh, you know, travel ban implemented by uh, by President Trump, which, by the way, the court upheld is constitutional. But so we file an, a friend of the court brief making legal arguments on behalf of half of national security experts uh, in favor of a of a decision and a policy that the uh, Southern Poverty Law Center disagrees with. And now that somehow makes us a, uh, a hate group and, uh, you know, puts us on the radar of uh, people like the attorney general Nessel. Um, that she's going to, you know, go after us, combat us, fight us, tackle us, however, you know, and, and this is weaponizing. Think about the power of the attorney general, how much power they, they have, you know, so much that they do, their investigations and everything are done secretly. They can get, you know, warrants and things. They, they can, I mean, it's just, when you think about the chilling effect of that, it's, uh, you know, it's, in, it's incredible and it shouldn't happen in the United States of America. And so that's why we filed our federal civil rights lawsuit. Um, the second case I want to mention is called, it's captioned Reform America versus City of Detroit during the 2019 Democrat, uh, Democratic presidential debates held at the Fox Theater in Detroit. The city police, working with the DNC, the Democratic National Committee, imposed draconian restrictions on the free speech rights of a pro-life group, not wanting their signage to be seen by the TV cameras, the CNN TV cameras, or attendees at the uh, going to the debates. At one point, the police placed the leader of the pro-life group, pro group in handcuffs, 
because he complained and pointed out that supporters of the candidates were allowed to carry signs on the public sidewalks that were closed that were uh, closed off to the pro-lifers. Now the district court judge that I mean it's it was plain what they were doing. It was viewpoint discrimination. They allowed the uh, you know the the candidates to have these what they call them candidate corrals, which were right at the edge of the public uh, sidewalks and public streets, where they could put all their you know all their the supporters of the candidates. So when the CNN cameras went on, saw all these people outside you know Fox Theater with signs you know supporting you know Biden or Bernie Sanders or Harris or any one of the you know the people that were running for the primaries. Meanwhile, anybody who was opposed to them were pushed off to what they called these free speech areas way away from the Fox Theater. And oh, by the way, even within those free speech areas, they, they, they divided them up by particular viewpoint. If they considered you to be pro-democratic party, you went on one side of the street. If you were anti-democratic party, you went to the other side of the street. My client signs mentioned nothing about which party they supported. They were all just pro-life signs. The police assumed, well, if they're pro-life, then they must be anti-democratic party. So they put them on one side of the street. All this is viewpoint-based discrimination. No basis for it. Judge ruled against us, and uh, we immediately appealed to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. As I always tell my clients, you uh, you, know, you often have to hold your nose in the district court and make law up in the appellate court. And that's where the vast majority of our victories are usually in the appellate court, which is better because you now have an appellate court decision, which is uh, a binding precedent and uh, a more favorable and stronger precedent than just a district court ruling. And our opening brief in that case is due in, uh, in early August. Robbie, if you can, just for our listeners briefly, because they're still going to wonder, how does a federal judge so misconstrue the First Amendment as to allow that kind of patent viewpoint discrimination? What was the judge's basis for his ruling? Well, her ruling, it was, uh, she said, well, they were, they were content neutral time, place, manner restrictions <laughs> to, because they had a concern for public safety, which they didn't. I mean, we had all the reports from the FBI and all the security, and they said there was no security threat. In fact, at one point, and this is, I mean, it's so crazy, they allowed the protesters to walk down the street. They had to walk with their group, walk quickly, just walk by, and then and then circle back around and go back to your, uh, you know, to your particular area. Well, if there was such a great threat of, you know, if these people are going to be a threat, why would you even do that for a minute? I mean, the reality is it makes zero sense. How can you even say that this was a, a content neutral um, restriction when you're actually dividing people up by the content of their message? I mean, we've seen, we've run across this, you know, uh, you know, many times. And uh, so we'll, we'll, uh, we're going to go up on appeal. I, it, it, it was indefensible, the, uh, the judge's ruling, which is again, why we're appealing it. And hopefully we get uh, some sanity in the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit that will uphold these, uh, you know, the constitutional rights of our, of our clients. And yeah, and just briefly, you know, for our listeners, every time we've sued the government and typically have won on First Amendment grounds, the government always says, well, we weren't discriminating against your viewpoint. We were sent, which is just patently unconstitutional. We were dis we were simply applying reasonable time, place and manner restrictions, which they're allowed to do. But what they've done is simply say, well, anytime we, we discriminate against pro-lifers, it's really just a manner or a place or a time restriction. And typically on appeal, uh, we end up winning those cases precisely because the, the lower court judge is simply buying in as an ideologue for the government censorship. You know, the other thing too that um, you see this all the time, uh, they'll say, well, it's, it, you know, it's for it to be a content-based restriction, you have to show that there was animosity towards the message. No, you don't. That's not what, that's not what, the, uh, what the law is. And you see that all the time. And they, they draw from dicta and other cases to come up with that. But that's what the law is. If a, if a police officer or an official makes a determination and to do so, he has to look at what the content of your message is, guess what? It's content-based. He may even agree with your message. But the fact that he's enforcing a policy that's based on him having to read what your message is, and plainly they had to, to divide up who the, where the demonstrators would go and, and, uh, and protest, then it's, it's content-based restriction. That's it. It doesn't require some you know, extra showing of you know, animosity, which is you know, when, you, when you're trying to prove motives and those sorts of things, those things are always difficult. But it doesn't matter if they, it doesn't require them to, 
to disfavor your message. It only requires them to make distinctions based on the message. That's why it's called content-based restriction and not, you know, uh, dislike your message-based restrictions. So that's one of the issues that we're constantly battling uh, battling with that. And and one of the issues that finally, after the Supreme Court ruled in the Mattel versus Tam, an issue we've been arguing for years and finally been prevailing on, is this idea that uh, a restriction on offensive speech is uh, is permissible in that it's, uh, you know, only a, a, there, there are some areas where you can make content-based restrictions in non-public forums. The place that we're talking about here in uh, and in Detroit was all the public streets and public sidewalks. You can't even have a content-based restriction. But we've been arguing time and time again that these restrictions on offensive speech is viewpoint-based, which is forbidden in every form. And finally, the Supreme Court uh, ruled in, 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 in accord with what we've been arguing for a long time. And so now we're starting to, uh, now we're winning those cases. In other um, words, so the, government, the government can't stop you in a public forum like a sidewalk, um, a public park, from holding up a sign that insults me or Jews or Muslims, you're allowed to insult people. And um, the response to insulting language is either to ignore them or to have counter speech, but the government can't intervene and begin to play the civility officer. And, yep. and that is one, one of the things I wanted you to just mention it also because they, they raised in the, it, at the trial court level and now on appeal, that it was a security threat. Talk about that, the, the um, v, you know, the um, veto, right? The Well, there's, there's a couple of components to that. One is obviously the heckless veto, right? You can't, right. You can't silence a message because um, somebody who opposes the message might be acting violently towards the speaker. The role of the government isn't to silence the speaker, it's to protect the peaker, speaker and stop the heckler. So we see that time and again. Or, you know, oftentimes they'll just generally say, well, we have a substantial or a compelling government interest. There's, there's really no dispute that, you know, if there is a, a serious safety threat that the government might have a compelling, a compelling interest, but they have to prove it. They can't just say that, oh, we have a compelling interest in stopping terrorists from, you know, blowing up the Fox Theater. Sure, I agree. You have a compelling edge, but where's the evidence that there's even that threat? We had the FBI's threat assessment. We had the the um, I forget it was a there was a Detroit um, Crime Commission group or something that did an assessment for the event, and all the assessments said zero threat of violence. Yet they put in these draconian restrictions, and they don't even have any evidence to support it. Nor are they the least restrictive means of supporting it. Right? If you want to, if you're worried about you know car bomb threats. Well, then you, you know, you cordon off the street so you don't allow vehicles through there. Or, you know, you put something in place that might, you know, inspect backpacks, right? So they don't have like a bomb like the marathon bombers. But that doesn't mean you shut the whole thing down to everybody, which is what they do. That's not a, that's not a narrowly tailoring or at least restrictive means to meet what your objective is. Unfortunately, they often operate uh, with a sledgehammer, right? And the, and the First Amendment requires them to operate with a scalpel. And so you have these draconian restrictions over broad and and you know not not permitting the speech that they should be allowed to 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 permit and again they're they're just they're just over inclusive and they restrict far more speech than necessary to meet whatever their objectives were so there's multiple reasons why this case should be overturned one is that they are content-based restrictions so they should be struck down and even if you assume the content neutrality they weren't narrowly tailored to support a, a substantial government interest. These things were overbroad and restricted more speech than necessary. So I, you know, I like our chances on uh, on appeal. Uh, two more cases, real quickly. You're almost running out of time. I not be able to get. Well, I'll, I'll get to them quickly. Um, one is uh, Ness versus City of Bloomington. That was a lawsuit we filed in Minnesota in 2019, alleging that the City of Bloomington, Minnesota, two city police officers, and the Hennepin County attorney. Hennepin County is um, is the the local county where our client. Uh, lived, violated our client's rights, Ms. Sally Ness, uh, rights protected by the First and Fourteenth Amendment by threatening to enforce local and state laws against her because all she did was peacefully film from a from a public forum um, all these exposing various zoning violations by a local mosque and associated school, which happened to be in her neighborhood. The neighbors kept complaining to the city about all the violations, the the extra traffic, the noise, all the things that. Uh, were in violation of the uh, the zoning ordinances that the city just ignored that this this mosque was doing, so she started filming them and 
re- giving the, the videos to the, you know, at the public hearing, sending them to our city officials. They were ignoring it. So she created a Facebook page and, um, and a blog so that, you know, the neighbors could chime in on this as well. And lo and behold, you know, she gets, uh, she gets threatened with, uh, uh, with a, a criminal prosecution for harassment, harassment for engaging in what is quintessential First Amendment protected activity. They also, in the meantime, because there was uh, one of the issues is that the, the city basically turned over its city park right there in the neighborhood that our client would go to with her grandchildren. They turned it over to the, uh, the Muslim school, and it, was over, and it was taken over by them, so it was no longer useful by the, the community. So they passed a, a city ordinance that said you can't videotape any children in a public park without the parents' consent. Well, that's a prior restraint and content-based restriction on speech. Right? How do you, the only way you can tell if somebody was videotaping a minor is by checking the person's videotape. And, and, the, and just to show how over-inclusive this was, um, or I should say, actually, it was under-inclusive and that didn't, if you're trying to, to combat some sort of evil, you could be on the corner, you could be at the edge of the park and it's a criminal violation to take this photograph, but take one step back, stand on a public sidewalk, take the very same photograph and it's okay. That when you have these types of exemptions or these types of under-inclusiveness, it calls into question the government's interest in regulating that speech to begin with. The attorney general, um, uh, the attorney general inter- intervened in the case to defend the, the state harassment statute. And we had actually a group of news reporters who uh, filed an amicus brief in our favor in the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit, um, arguing, and appropriately so, that this type of restriction on filming in public of matters in public view, right? She wasn't going into school secretly recording or anything. These are all matters in public view from a public sidewalk would have dramatic uh, effects on uh, on the ability of news reporters. I mean, think about too, and this is, Hennepin County is where the whole George Floyd thing started, right? What, how did that all erupt? Because you had an individual who was there with their, you know, iPhone videotaping the uh, police malfeasance and making it known to the public. That's nothing more than what Sally Ness was doing, except she happened to be doing it to what uh, she considered to be violations of zoning ordinances and zoning laws by this, uh, by this local mosque. I argued this case before the U. Uh, we lost in the district court. We expected to lose. We got a, a, a left-wing judge there. And uh, we appealed to the U.S. Court of Appeals, the Eighth Circuit. I argued that uh, recently, just uh, I think a month or so ago, and we're waiting for a decision. Last case, real quickly. This is Brown versus City of Tulsa, another case we filed in 2019. This one we filed in federal court in Oklahoma against the City of Tulsa and its chief of police on behalf of Wayne Brown, who was a Tulsa police officer um, who went through the academy, was still in his probationary uh, period, and, uh, and he, was, he was fired. He was fired because some local political activists went to his Facebook, uh, his Facebook page, scrolled through you know, for years and years and years in the past and found some some uh, Facebook posts that were favorable of Donald Trump, uh, favorable of uh, police um, dealing with uh, with riotous behavior. And uh, they claimed that, you know, because this uh, con- these conservative social media posts by Brown made him uh, ineligible to be a Tulsa police officer um, because and this was all during the obviously the height of this anti-police uh, sentiment. And the city of Tulsa fired him, fired him because of Facebook posts that he posted up Years before he even applied to be a Tulsa police officer, um, they and so we we uh, we sued the city of Tulsa and his chief of police on uh, First Amendment grounds. They filed a motion to dismiss. We responded, and we're still waiting for a decision um, from the court in that case. So that's my wrap up of uh, the cases I wanted to highlight today. Uh, David, any uh, any closing comments before I close this out? No, good job. I like the, uh, I'm, I'm glad that we were finally able to update our listeners on those cases. Yeah, we'll have to continue to update because we got more more things going on. And down the pike. Every, every uh, seems like every week. But uh, thanks again. That's all the time we have today. We look forward to our next discussion. We want to thank all of you uh, for joining us. Uh, one programming note, we will not be reporting a recording a podcast next Thursday, July 8th, as I'll be up north in Grand Rapids, Michigan selecting a jury for a pro-life trial scheduled for later in that month later in the uh this month um as you know our video casts are posted on our rumble and youtube channels and our podcasts are posted on spotify and stitcher if you like the content please follow us and please spread the word thank you again have a fantastic day celebrating our great nation on july 4th and may god bless you and may he continue to bless america amen <laughs>